Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Before we go ahead and finish off year 1374, year of lightning storms, and uh, we get into some years where things are going to start moving pretty fast here. Before we do that, I wanted to go through an anthology uh, real fast. We'll actually cover two here. Let's look at Realms of Magic. Okay, again, just very quickly going through these. First one, Guinevar by R.A. Salvatore, taking place all the way back in 253. The Secret Origin of Gwen. She was a cat who was put into a stone. Shock. Smoke Powder and Mirrors by Jeff Grubb. Apprentice Wizarding Hijinks and Waterdeep. The Magic Thief by Mark Anthony. Decent little riff on DOA. Quiet Place by Christy Golden. Fun little gender adventure. It's like he's got his own CW show that's going on throughout these anthologies. The Eye of the Dragon by Ed Greenwood. Didn't read through it very much. Every Dog Has His Day by Dave Gross. Shockingly really did not like this. The Common Spell by Kate Novak Grubb. Kind of an alias story, but not really. Odd framing device whose twist in, on the story is quite telegraphed, but not bad, just meh. The First Moonwell by Douglas Niles. Didn't make it very far through that one. The Luck of Llewellyn the Loquacious by Alan C. Kupfer. Not bad, just kind of a shaggy dog story. Didn't really lead anywhere. Too Familiar by David Cook. I don't know what's up with that. Red Ambition by Gene Robb. Rabe. However you say that. Zaztam is evil and likes to laugh a lot. <laughs> Everything's very funny when you're evil. Thieves Roared by Mary H. Herbert. More of that thief. Uh, Six of Swords by William W. Connors. Kind of a fun little post-adventuring tale. The Wild Bunch by Tom Dupree about a silly wizard. <laughs> A Worm Too Soft by J. Robert King, by far the best of the bunch. Seriously done, uh, well put together. Really enjoyed that one. Gun Runner by Roger E. Moore. A really nice mystery, but having to do with literally guns. What's this doing in the realms? It just, I assume that they were kind of getting desperate for <laughs> weapons at that point, and so they introduced guns, but oh man, it just doesn't feel like it should be in there at all. The, the story, however, is good, so I look forward to other stuff for more. The direct approach by Elaine Cunningham had to do with Starlight and Shadows, it looked like, so uh, yeah, did not read that. Also, very quickly, Realms on the Underdark is the next one. I, I thought the way that they put this together was interesting, because it's really only uh, two or three much longer stories, and then two or three shorter stories, and some framing devices. But it's the Underdark, and it looked like it had to do with, like, everything that I hate about the Underdark. So, I'm skipping that one. Let's move on now and finish off the Twilight War Shadow Realm by Paul S. Kemp. Oh my god, was this good. <laughs> it was so, so good. And I, so, oh man, uplifting, heartbreaking, like, you know... It's books like these that we learn to read for. There, there was just so much that was awesome about it. There, there are scary bits. Uh, Kemp does great kind of horror stuff. While they're in the Shadow Realm itself, you see these like hulking horrors that seem to be giant humanoids with like red eyes slowly walking in the distance, and it's like, what the hell is up with that? And then. There's aerial combat with this uh, Kessin Rell who has, uh, you know, is like part god and so on and so forth. And, and, and there are just so many great things going on here. And the way that it ends, oh man, it's like a gut punch, but it's so good. And it, and it just, it, it feels like, yes, this makes sense. And there's so many things that he sets in play for the sequel, the, the Cycle of Night trilogy, which uh, ended up just being the one book, Godborn. I cannot imagine how frustrating it must have been for the people who read this when it came out, and then Godborn just drifted off. And it's like that that book that Elaine Cunningham uh, was supposedly going to write for fourth edition. Like every year, new new gossip would come about saying that it, it was going to get made this year and everything. And uh, you know, now we're in fifth edition, so it obviously never did. But thankfully, at least Godborn got to have a chance to exist. I'm I'm really looking forward to it because I'm very curious to find out what some of the secrets hinted at here are. I won't go into too much detail here because it's like, you know, to tell you that I shed a tear when da-da-da happened. 
either I'm going to be spoiling it for the people who haven't read it, or I'm just going to be, you know, doing that thing like on Saturday Night Live, you know, the fake interview, like, wasn't it cool when this happened? You know, this is such a great book, and it's so sad that it's damn near ruined by the ungodly, annoying, shitty, shitty, shitty proofreading slash editing. I don't know if the editor is also the copy editor on these books or what, but they were obviously having a bad day or not paying attention or something. There are things in here like two commas right together. Uh, at one point, it's Erebus Cali, C-A-L-L-E, just on and on and on and on, just all these horrible, horrible things. That's one of the things that I really wanted to mention. The other thing is... <laughs> Poor Furlanastus, okay? If, if, does anybody who's read this know what I'm talking about here? We have this scene where Furlanastus is this dragon who helps out these Lathanderites take down a lot of the Shadow Realm baddies. Even though Furlanastus is kind of evil, but he owes Kale one, and so he helps him out and blah, 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 and it, you know, it takes a lot out of him. He's ripped apart, just torn apart, and he is on his last legs, on the field of battle after it's done, dying, breathing his last breaths. Reg, this likable, like, first lieutenant from the Lathanderites, comes up to him and basically pats him on the head and is like, you know, I saw a hero here today with you, you know? And Furlanastus is like, thanks for that. And it talks about, <laughs> while he's talking to him like this, it talks about how all of Reg's men, you know, they're all clerics, they're all out on the field finding any men they can who are still alive even if they are at death's door and casting heal on them. And Reg is like touching Furlanastus while he's alive and saying like, it was really good fighting with you. Die well. Goodbye. <laughs> and Furlanastus is like, uh, thanks. And I'm like, really? He couldn't have even given him a friggin' cure minor wounds, the one hit point that it would take to make it so that he would stabilize and then he could heal on his own, perhaps? No, we just watch him die, even though you are a cleric who feels that he has done good. Like, what a terrible cleric wretch is. So I felt really bad for Furlanastus. Also, oh my god, Tamlin. <laughs> Tamlin isn't in this one as much, but... Uh, Tamlin is just awesome. I love where this leaves Tamlin at the end of it. The one thing that I think is a really big, uh, something that was overlooked or something that could have they could have done more with in this series is all of the um, the Oscevrans, you know, because they've all had at least one book about them. It really feels like them just kind of being stuck as prisoners of war for the entire thing feels very, very, very unrealistic. And it's like, I'm just absolutely certain that they were doing other stuff during this time. And since I'm going through the anthologies, I'll be curious, uh, once I get up to it, I I've read all the stuff in Realms of Shadow, but I'm at least going to glance through it again because it's like, was there not even a short story in there about the Uskeverans just being like, no, nah, it's cool, we'll just stay here and be prisoners of war? I mean, that seems like a big deal to me. Especially since Tamlin and Kale both get so much screen time, and obviously, uh, you know, Tazzy's mentioned a lot and so on and so forth. That just, that, that felt like a, 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 a big thing that was missing. Like, you know, I, I can assume that all the stuff that they did didn't have any impact on the plot that we're looking at here but I have to imagine that they did a lot more than just be prisoners. And yeah, Tamlin's story, though, it's like Godfather level of tragic. It is so awesome to see that happen. I'm, I'm curious as to what Clayton Emery and uh, Dave Gross thought of that. And we'll end this off with House of Serpents 3, Vanity's Brood by Lisa Smedman. Really a come down after Shadow Realm. Does not feel as exciting an end to a trilogy. I mean, you know, in Shadow Realm we're fighting gods and crap. And, and, and then over here it's kind of, eh. There are a lot of, like, encounters for a single party group. It kind of feels like an Ultima game <laughs> sometimes because it's like, what's this problem the local Talos priests are having? Must investigate, you know? Uh, and you're like, how about the main plot? Well, okay, this is kind of interesting. Let's go and break some pots or whatever. Basically, I think my big problem here is the end of book two kind of promises one sort of story. By the end of the prologue, half of that is thrown away. By the end of chapter two, the other half is tossed as well. 
Book three's prologue should have been book two's epilogue. Then I might have been curious about everything that's going on. As it was, I was just underwhelmed because everything that I thought was really cool about book two and the way that it ended is just tossed, like, almost immediately. It predisposed me to not get very excited about this book. Having two climaxes is fun, just in general, and as applied to this book. Arvin having one tea heritage makes perfect sense. I assumed he was mind-seated in book three most of the time, and that was just going to be a secret, but uh, I, I guess it was just that he's ruthless because he's part yuan I thought that worked out pretty well. In general, I like Smedman's writing. I mean, it was enough to keep me interested and finish the book, obviously, but it, it's weird. I kind of felt like even she was a little bit like, oh, let's just get this over with by the end, and I don't know, maybe I'm totally wrong there. But it feels as if it just didn't follow through on a lot of the stuff that it promised. And I thought the end of book two was so strong. And I was really excited about what was going to go on here. But it's really just like there's one, I guess, two goals. And they kind of have to take 311 pages to be achieved, you know? Very, very frustrating in that sense. But not bad, just a very kind of... Eh, you know, that, that that finishes the story, I guess, sort of ending. Can you believe it looks like uh, next round we will probably be finishing up 3rd edition? Uh, that is crazy to think about because of, you know, how how long it's taken to get here. Um, <laughs> second, first and 2nd edition did not take this long. Yeah, it's uh, it looks like we're going to be doing it. I'm not really sure where to cut, uh, cut it off and make a new playlist because so many things take place through the entire thing. Probably I'm going to cut it off with uh, the, the Empyrean Odyssey. I guess that one just seems the biggest uh, kind of change overall because that's the change to the cosmology. We'll see when we get there. You know, maybe I'll feel differently about something. But speaking of the upcoming books and the order they're in and so on and so forth, I'm going to try. If I forget this, please somebody make a comment and remind me that I didn't do it. But I'm going to try when I post this. Oh, which, by the way, it's June 7th right now. June 7th, 2014, if I didn't say that. I'm going to try and list what I have uh, as far as years for everything coming up. Because A, right now Olav, uh, the resource that I generally use, has disappeared. So I have what I cut and pasted from there uh, and used as my guideline from day one, but I don't know how, uh, you know, who knows, maybe they're going to come back up and it's going to be redesigned and it'll have all the way through fourth edition and that would be awesome, but it doesn't, I, I'm, I'm guessing they're probably just done because they hadn't updated it in two years. I even wrote them to ask if I could help out and uh, got no response. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to put up the timeline that I have with the things that, I, I know years for, and just ignore all the one, two, three, four, five. That was just me kind of figuring out, like, if, you know, if I read everything, what are we looking at as far as uh, the next five? I kind of plan that out while I'm going to see where we're going to fall. But the thing is, is that there are a lot of unknowns on here. Like, for instance, Mark, Mark Sehested's Chosen of Nwandan. Uh, those are unknown, uh, as far as I know. You know, obviously I'm gonna read one, two, and three. My plan as of now is just to kinda throw them into 1478, 1479. Um, if, if, if nothing else seems better, you know, like maybe, uh, maybe like Chosen of Nwanda and put like one, 1477, 78, 79, or 78, 79, 80, something like that. And, and there are a bunch of them in there. I'd, I'd like you guys to take a look at them. And if anybody has any suggestions as to, oh, this should definitely go before this, or, oh, this is definitely this year, so on and so forth, I would really appreciate the help. But yeah, for now, uh, that's it from me, and uh, I will see you next time when we will dig into some dungeon goodness, looks like. Uh, Going to be dealing with Star Deep and uh, Depths of Madness, most likely. But for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. Realms Remembered.